Yeah, so I uh, welcome back uh, to this part of this uh, symposium. So Shaheen Lakhan, again, I would have the great honor and privilege to actually introduce our next speaker. I, we were just chatting on how I love the simplicity um, and the power, almost the apt of this title, Pandemic Challenges. This is uh, Vito Levi uh, Dancona. He's an entrepreneur, engineer, investor who's quite passionate about uh, working with outstanding individuals to solve niche market problems with deep tech solutions. He has co-founded several institutions, um, uh, Scientific Venture Partners, NEMDX, uh, Q Biotics, Etheria, Theros, Phygenesis, uh, Solus, Microtext. Uh, I, I think this could just go on, but I want to save some time for your presentation, Vito. <laughs> so you. without further ado, this the, the, the platform is all yours. Thank you. Uh, so last year, I had the honor to be invited to participate to a panel where my contribution was about shareholder alignment. This year, I will be applying some of the themes that touched on when talking about shareholder alignment on a much bigger scale as we think about pandemic challenges and a possible framework for solutions. I will be applying my direct experience as an investor across multiple business and sectors, an executive, a co-founder of companies, and an engaged citizen in Boston, along those with my colleagues of Scientific Venture Partners, an organization dedicated to commercializing science and technology. Nearly all of us have been affected, both for good and for bad. Our thoughts are for those who are no longer and for those who lost their jobs or businesses. Unemployment is a major challenge it will haunt us for the foreseeable future with implications that affect the democratic societies. Making a society fairer is one of the major challenges of our time. But these considerations are for another day. Today, we will be talking about some lessons we have learned during the past year and, half, and how my colleagues and I have adjusted our investments and entrepreneurial efforts to align with all stakeholders. Wherever we are on the earth, we face the same pandemic, cha pandemic challenges. There is no way to hide. Humankind has a habit of repeating mistakes of the past, even when we passed this less than a month ago. How much time has lost? Learning how to adapt to, uh, to the pandemic challenges in January 2020 in China, then in February in Italy, then in March throughout Europe, then in the US and Russia, and most recently in India. Looking back in history, there's not this is not the first time that lack of alignment and poor and exclusive communication have prevented us to effectively tackle the spread of a pandemic. Excavating a record of plagues past, we can find great examples of when people collaborated, like with polio um, epidemics in the 12th, 20th century, or when there have been areas of poor collaboration. The web is awash of, with uh, unenlightening parallels. Entire society took the mask wearing during the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. Local authorities concealed information about the bubonic plague in 1665 in London and even most some countries nowadays as well. Hopefully we will learn, however, that we are a single planet and no matter where we are on the planet, a disease happening or appearing in Asia will also appear in America, in Europe, in Oceania, and Africa. So the key realization of today's speak, speak will be that we are all on this, in this together. We woke up with the fact that disease are no longer local, something that scientific communities had been warning us for about over a decade. We all get affected equally. Germans, Italians, Indians, Russian, Chinese, American. We are all humankind on Earth, and what affects one individual may affect others on the other side of the planet, and very quickly. Once we realize this, that this is an issue of a society, we will be aligned to move forward. Which brings me back to one of the themes of this talk, alignment. As a solution, as well as a philosophy, as we engage with the main challenges of a pandemic. Alignment across all people in the world, all stakeholders across our many societies, how to survive the challenges and how to become stronger. 
In industry, key is alignment between management and culture. If times get tough and you need to follow people or ask managers to accrue reduced compensation for a period and people are worried if companies will ever survive, suppliers are being extended, et cetera, et cetera. Does everyone get in the foxhole with you because we're all in this together or does everyone go scrambling? A tool that managers have actually is focus. Keep the best employees. Really focus on projects that add value. Strip out anything non-essential with the knowledge that the companies that survived the pandemic are good companies and now are actually in a good shape. For a company to survive, we need to realize that no industry is insulated from the other. We all suffer from supply chain disruptions. Entrepreneurs and investors like me will work to deliver both short and long-term ways to solve pandemic supply constraints with new technologies like phone testing or replacement displacing on PCR. But during the intense months of the pandemic, small short-term improvements come from practicalities of resolving problems. We have to scratch our head to think of where get samples from for our studies, where to find consumables, how to hire and train staff, get rid of clinical waste. Now it seems that operations are running normal, but getting operations all working again can be painful. The press really talks about the supply chain issues until last March, actually. Some sectors fit better than others, possibly less an issue in life science than another industry like semiconductors, as we heard earlier today, one of the speeches. However, even in life sciences, some countries have experienced a real shortage of everything, from plastic gloves to, to uh, plates, or have reached stress points like capacity of incineration of disposals. In, exit, in the exit phases of a pandemic, where supplies have started to be available, but things cost more to produce, some countries have enough PCR instruments from Thermo, Tican, and can turn on with uh, with the instruments region when needed, but cannot turn test due to shortage of glass and outclaves. Industry and governments ought to be thinking of what are the key strategic sources in their country. If or when another pandemic happens, as we have learned that this is hard to ramp up capacities, capacities from scratch. Industries and governments really need to think hard on the reliance on our countries like China to provide active ingredients for essential medicines, or even non-essential vitamin supplies, which credible in price at the height of the pandemic last year. Only a strong alliance between industry and government can help us to prepare for the next pandemic challenges. Within a supplies business, how are employees aligned to face pandemic challenges? This is a key question we ask ourselves for all of our companies. With, with everyone suddenly working remotely, remotely, are employees motivated? Self-starting in people who are passionate about their work and understand their mission, so they work even more effectively when you take away commute time or other friction? Or does productivity lag without as much management and direct oversight? Or do you have the culture where people ask for help and make problems when it's a big, harder, harder pick up than ask? Definitely more attention needs to be dedicated to retraining workforce, educate unemployed for introduction in workforce. As importantly, we need to study our alignment aspects between employees and companies. We have learned, we have been forced to learn during the COVID lockdowns, the key assumptions of every productive economy that people need to live where we work has been shattered, possibly permanently. permanently. It turns out many of the best jobs really can be performed from anywhere, through screens or the internet. It turns out that people can live in small city or small towns or in rural nowhere, but still be just as productive as they live in a tiny one-room walk in a big city. Uh, big city. It turns out companies really are capable of organizing and sustainable, sustaining remote work, even perhaps especially in the most sophisticated and complex fields. This is, I believe, a permanent cultural shift. It is perhaps one of the most important shifts that happens in my lifetime, made possible by the internet, but maybe even more important than the internet. Perhaps divorcing physical location from economic opportunity gives us a real shot at radically expanding the number of jobs in the world, while also dramatically improving the quality of life of millions or billions of people. We may, as long, at long last, shatter the geographic lottery 
open up opportunities to countries of people who were lucky enough to be born in the right place. And people are leaping at the opportunity this shift is already creating, moving both homes and jobs at furious rates. It will take years to understand where this leads, but I'm extremely optimistic if we find ways to keep employees aligned. Another, oops, another challenge is how industry is aligned with governments in terms of speed of reaction. We have wished regulators adoption could be much faster. We discussed that many calls, uh, uh, many sessions in this conference here today. Perhaps we could ask if regulatory affairs are supporting or holding back the industry. Should governments enable rapid innovations that are going to make a difference in our life or insist that regulators hold on on rigid and old formats? Having a real look at this area and enabling a fast track approach for younger, nimble companies could really make a difference. A big positive is that COVID has shaken the financial establishment across the world. We've not discussed this in, this in this session, but this is really an important part. Finally, investors seem to start to realize that we need to listen to scientists, to invest in climate crisis, to invest in healthcare, pandemic resilience. But if we do not, as a species, we may not deserve to be on this planet. Generally, there has been a change in mentality of a few thought leaders, we need to harness that. Investors have the opportunity to select businesses that should recognize the economic burden of pandemics and really fight for stronger preparedness. Now, moving to governments, there is good and bad news. Governments do learn from experiences, but because the history does yield ambiguous, ambiguous lessons, different conclusions can be drawn from the same set of events, and lessons can sometimes be learned or too well or not well at all. To this extent, government and companies should increase coordination. How to prepare to combat mis- and disinformation during a pandemic? Early in the pandemic, many countries, including the US, have suffered from a misalignment with government and industry. Our hope is that this mis misalignment is rectified and our efforts should be dedicated to improve the alignment with governments. In practice, this is not so simple, however. We need a multifactorial approach for pandemic preparedness. The response has to be a permanent answer to government and a continued effort to innovation and continuous improvement supported by industry. And the good news is that people have been forced to think. In the US, President Biden seems to have understood that there are two pieces of it, changing social contract and start to point capital. In testing, in testing, for example, governments should work to be ready for the next event and should find smarter and joint ways to do testing, possibly could centralize diagnostics or run backlog of other testing in time of no pandemic. Japan has three major centralized labs in Europe, UK got its act together, whereas Germany and France have not led, lived up to the challenge. Small countries are like Denmark, uh, but as for the large countries, I think the UK is the only one who really lived up to the challenge. Arguably, the UK did, with, did well because centralized laboratories were implemented from government and not from the NHS. The industry message to government could be that the challenge is not technology, but infrastructure to mobilize technology. It is the industry job in collaboration with academia and innovators and entrepreneurs to come up with technology. Government should be investing in infrastructure to mobilize, to mobilize it, including in public and private partnership that leverage what the industry is best at. Alignment can be achieved by having the various constituencies to focus on their core competences. Oops, excuse me, I'm moving too fast. I don't know what's happening. Okay. The outcome of the alignment is health. One of the biggest takeaways from this past year is the need for solutions that maintain the health of the populations, that give people what they want and a way out of intractable problems. At times, there has been a temptation to get out of intractable problems with authoritarian approaches, which may be particularly difficult to implement if we want to remain true to Western value, values or self-determination self individual choices. 
that's exactly what happened in the case of the pandemic. The U.S. didn't beat the coronavirus by locking up people in their homes against their wills, but aligned with people by investing new technologies that let them live their lives as they wished. Some of us have learned that even if pandemic preparedness was not there, there are ways to live through it. But how many people in the world did not make it or have not learned this? As a solution and response to the pandemic is a global co collaboration and cooperation and a certain level of altruism to do what's best for the global community. This is essentially readiness. This is essential for readiness as well. And this is providing to be a challenge in countries, for example, China and Russia. Our challenge, talking about pandemic challenges, oops, sorry, going this way. We should now have a realization whether we have a physical preparedness. Is it there or is it here to stay? Will be used for other pathological, will we be used to other pathological diseases? Will they happen? Well, hopefully no. However, when thinking of pandemic challenges, one of the biggest challenges is that memory is short. Historians have remarked that the 1918 influenza pandemic was soon forgotten, a collective amnesia based perhaps on the fact that the catastrophic scale of suffering made it too painful to remember. There is no danger of that for this pandemic. When it is over, whatever that means, there will be no one who has not been tweeted, broadcast, written, sung, blogged, or otherwise opined on COVID-19. But what will our recovery look like? What does history tell us about whether a society will be marked or scarred? It turns out that our pandemics can inspire forgetting as well as remembering. So education is needed. We have experiments positive of movement in these directions. We all witnessed in these past difficult periods that governments intervened heavily in the industry of devices and diagnostics. Going forward, we could argue that governments could spend as much as fighting the flag of terrorism as wars against enemies online and on our borders, as well as fighting wars against pandemic. Their challenges and our challenges will be to build capabilities and bring the recent learning into practices creating rule books to be prepared for the future. But their ultimate challenge will be to resist the inevitably short-minded view of most politicians that in saying three to 10 years will start defunding what they would perceive to be excessive and unjustifiable spending pandemic preparedness. In recognition of this, perhaps we should ask government to focus on writing a rule book on pandemics in a number of fronts, to train civil servants on who to give money and how to spend money and not to waste money, to avoid pirates. We've seen many of this in multiple countries. To invest in new technology matching investor funds rather than having civil servants deciding what to do. To educate that diseases can incubate anywhere in the world to then manifest on our doorstep. We need to educate to collaborate globally. So how to face the challenge? Our suggestion is seize the moment, act now. This is now and in the next year. If we do not seize the moment, the moment will pass. If we seize it, we all do this. We will accelerate, accelerate this virtuous, virtuous cycle. If we miss the boat, our society will be disintegrated. Never has a more receptive audience to the scientific community been than now, particularly to scientists. It is now the moment to push the best communicators in the industry to evangelize what we do. There are some great communicators. My call is to support the scientists which can communicate best with the wider public. So here's my colleagues and I. Uh, the last part of this speech will be about what we are doing. So we have four partners who have co-founded, managed, and invested in a number of deep technology companies in healthcare security communication. We have experienced the effect of the misalignments across most of our companies. The COVID-19 pandemics has precipitated a historical, historical autopsy 
to unearth teachable lessons. This is how we see the world in light of what we have experienced in the past year and a half, as we think of how we weather the storm that is coming to be for in alignment. Markets are emotional and financial markets that are emotional and are driven by financial returns, but also by other matrices. In getting alignment of interest with investors, if the world is perfect, it would be easy to maintain alignment of interest over a long period of time, requires, requires really, really a, a great, enormous amount of trust. Hard won and easy to lose. The key here is trust and keeping it and not losing it. To establish a long-term alignment of interest requires an enormous amount of trust by a large number of people. Trust can be eroded in many ways, including misinformation. And many people serve their own interests by undermining that trust. From our side, to align investors with purpose, we're encouraging investors to invest in projects that do good rather than just generate good financial returns. We formed a new fund management business to raise funds on the public markets to democratize the opportunity for ordinary people to invest in a better future. That will be but a small drop in the ocean, but we wish that more people join this thinking so that we create at least a lake to increase and widen our impact. I will give you some specific examples how we responded to pandemic challenges using the theme of, the theme of alignment. We have been working on interesting technologies to prevent disease spread and prevent pandemics. The approach here is to build long-lasting infrastructure to autonomously and continually and cost-effectively test wastewater so that the next episode of local outbreaks can be quickly identified before affecting entire populations and to provide ample warning to local municipalities to enact local healthcare measures and to provide ample time to industry to arrange logistics. This is another example of alignment of different specialties in this case, that before the pandemic were sort of insulated. A medical device to assist people who are intubated, breathing tubes, may often develop dysphagia. Dysphagia is the medical term for swallowing difficulties. Dysphagia may, take patients may make patients stay in ICU for a long time. Before the pandemics, we had shown that pharyngeal electrical stimulation can help those patients be extubated earlier and or without the risk of their intubation, and therefore get them out of the ICU faster and free of capacity. During the pandemic, however, we have observed a significant number of COVID-19 patients which are at risk of neurogenic, uh, neurogenic dysphagia due to prolonged mechanical ventilations, and the rate are staggering in the midst of a global pandemic. We applied pharyngeal electrical stimulations to critically ill COVID-19 patients and observed successful treatment of intubated, intubation induced severe neurological post-extubation dysphagia using pharyngeal electrostimulation in a COVID-19 patients. Patients are discharged faster from the ICU to a non-intensive medical department after final pharyngeal electrostimulation treatment session. We also spend time looking at supply chain constraints, especially in the time of pandemic. This process led us to think hard of changing our processes to remove supply chain constraints, not only working with the industry, but also changing technology. We looked at how to build technologies based on local supplies so that each country, if and when needed, can scale up its, their operations without needing foreign supplies and avoid failing into the opposite of the new cold, sorry, I mean cold piece. The example here is dependence on enzymes for the testing, i.e. PCR COVID testing. In our case, we looked at technology solutions that do not require enzymes, which are produced in few parts of the world. So in summary, despite many challenges, I'm optimistic, and I think, on the whole, governments are trying to do the right thing. We have much more clearly defined response to deal with current and future pandemics. There is a universal understood playbook. Vaccines work and can be produced quickly and rolled out at scale. Mass testing is more accurate and widely available. 
technology de deployment can be accelerated as solutions to change to challenges emerge. Science has come to be for reputations have um, helped us and the public are engaged. We're all experts in diagnostics and vaccine vernacular. But as we emerge from the crisis, we can't carry on as we did before. There must be alignment between all of the societies and stakeholders. There must be common policies, protocol, and international objectives. And I, with this, I conclude my presentation. Vito, that that was fantastic. It was the first a whirlwind. Maybe maybe a little emphasis on on Italian imagery, but that's okay. I, <laughs> that's my background. I cannot say anything. Hey, about exactly. It. Yes. No. But but truly, you remind us that we live in uh, in uh, really this world community, and we are global citizens. Uh, it also showed the short sightedness that we might have uh, our decay rate of information knowledge, at least being in our working memory. Is, uh, has never been uh, this this short in, in history. Uh, and uh, you've really uh, brought that to the forefront um, of our attention. And then also this, this concepts of uh, government, um, you know, really developing the infrastructure uh, that mobilizes uh, the pathway, you know, for the technologies that we in industry build. I, I, that resonated wholeheartedly uh, with me. And you gave examples um, where that's in place and, and where that's not uh, in present time and, and in the past. I, I must say it was a whirlwind journey and I've you know, learned a great deal. You know